Church. Father, we thank you for the leadership uh, meeting tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you speak to every heart in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that this teaching of your word will not miss anyone. We listen attentively. We reach our heart. We reach our soul. And you transform our ministries in Jesus' name. Let every word sink into every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Titus chapter 2. As you understand, Paul the Apostle had reaching to Titus, a young minister like us. Or young ministers like us. And he gave him a mandate. And Titus received that mandate actually from Christ. But through Paul the Apostle, you understand, when Joshua received the mandate, it was from God. But it came through Moses. The same thing with us. The mandate may come through a senior pastor, may come through a group pastor, may come through a region of a seer, or state of a seer, or national of a seer, or it may come through the general superintendent, through a man, a minister. And yet it is coming from God to you. And this mandate that has come from God to you, delivered by a human leader, is a mandate that goes beyond your natural strength, your natural power. Any mandate God gives to the minister is higher than the minister, is higher than the man. And as we look at the mandate we're coming to, Titus chapter 1 verse 5. It says, For this cause let I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, the things that are lacking, the things that are imperfect, the things that are not proper, the things that are not according to the plan of God for the church in the New Testament. Titus, you have to be in that church and search everything in order. And then he goes on to say, and ordain elders, ordain pastors, ordain teachers, ordain leaders in every church, every city, as I had appointed thee. And then you come to chapter 2 now, which is uh, the passage you have read today for our search, the scripture preparation. In chapter 2 verse 1, it says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The things which align together were sound doctrine. The things that agree were sound doctrine. The things that befit sound doctrine. Speak thou the things that support, encourage, confirm sound doctrine. Verse 7. In all things, how many things? In all things, showing thyself. Titus, you have a ministry. Titus, you have a calling. Titus, you have a commission. And you have to show that your appointment was not a mistake. Your appointment was not something imposed on you. It says you will show yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness. When you teach, that's what doctrine means in teaching. In the things to lay line upon line, precept or precept, it says you will be without any corruption and gravity. You'll be serious. You'll be grave. You'll not be frivolous. You'll not be carefree. You'll not be nonchalant. You'll not be just like floating in the air. And you're not going to be an unserious character, it says, with sincerity as well. Then it says in verse 8, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part, the person who didn't know about that doctrine before, when you teach. The person that didn't know about that topic before, when you teach. The person that didn't know about that concept, that conviction, and did not, do, did not understand the teaching of the word of God on that line before the person on the contrary part will be ashamed 
having nothing evil to say of you, concerning you. As you look at the mandate then that you had received, it was a kind of mandate that where without any shadow of doubt, Titus knew this is work. And this is going to be a real body. It's going to be a real challenge. And the minister must understand that before he can carry out this kind of challenge and this kind of commission, this kind of mandate, he must, number one, have real salvation. Genuine salvation. How can somebody who is not saved lead another person into the experience of salvation? Not only that, number two, he must have a conscious void of offense toward God and man. If you are carrying something on your mind, if you have guilt on your mind, if you have condemnation on your mind, if there is a kind of private failure and then you come to the public, your courage is gone. Because you're even having challenging yourself. And then if you have people in the congregation there that said, uh-uh, look at him reading the Bible, look at him talking holiness, look at him uh, emphasizing this and that, but look at what went on between him and I, between her and myself. There must be a clear conscience, void of offense toward God and toward man. Before you can carry out this mandate, there must be a genuine, clear, sincere experience of sanctification. There must be victory over sin, over temptation. There must be triumph over self. Self would have been taken to the cross, nailed to the cross, and dead. And because of that, now you're calm, spiritually, you're strong. And spiritually, you can stand, you have backbone. He is saved. He has a conscience for the offense toward God and man. He is sanctified, entirely sanctified. He is consecrated and committed to the Lord. He is triumphing over self. He has the authentic baptism in the Holy Ghost with power, endowment of power from on high. This is what it requires. Before we can fulfill the demand that the Lord has given unto us in these few verses we're looking at today. Look at this challenge. Look at what he received. I'm coming back to this uh, Titus chapter 1 again. And it says in verse 5, uh, it said, For this cause, for this reason, Titus, you are there for a purpose. You're not going to be distracted. You're not going to be diverted. You're not going to jump on another wagon that is going somewhere else. You're not going to concentrate on what the people are thinking about. You should concentrate on for this reason, for this purpose, for this cause. I let thee encourage that thou shouldest set in order. If you don't have backbone, you cannot set anything in order. If you're not higher, greater, wiser than the people you are leading, you cannot set them in order. And if you don't have the courage and the stamina that this is wrong and this should not be there, the people who do evil normally, they have a kind of courage. And they have a kind of backbone. They have a kind of support. They have a kind of people assuring them, go ahead and do that evil thing. If anything happens, we're behind you. And if you are not courageous yourself, as courageous as the people on the contrary side, as courageous as the people that are making things disorderly in the church, you will not be able to stand and stand firm and set things in order. And here Paul, the apostle, said, you know, Titus, you're not going there to play. You're not going there to play games. You are there to go and set things in order, the things that are wanting there. And I pray that your local church, God will help you. And you cannot, you know, you cannot be friends with people. You know, you have their favorites, you have friends, you have this and that. And those friends and favorites are doing something wrong. And they're part of the things you need to set in order. You cannot have favorites and, you know, be dancing around them and say, Brother, you know, this is not right. How could you do this? And you are my friend. If I do this, now do that. You cannot do that. 
And that's why you need to kind of come apart and then stand on a platform that is higher than the people spiritually and morally. And in everything you're calling, you know that this is where you are and you have to set things in order. And I'm praying that God will help you. Amen. You will succeed. Amen. I said you will succeed. Amen. You have the boldness and the courage and the conviction and the character, the charisma to be able to get that done and then to appoint people. Appoint people. That's very difficult to appoint the right person for the right thing at the right time. And then you're not going to be bribed into Joseph putting somebody there. That's why it says in verse 9, look at chapter 1 verse 9. It says in verse 9, holding fast. Because we need this, holding fast the faithful word as she has been taught, that she may be able to be, to, he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Then he tells, uh, he told uh, Titus the kind of people he will meet there when he gets to Crete. And a kind of, uh, you know, backsliders, subverters, and, you know, the people that are teaching erroneous things, you'll meet there, he prepared his mind, you'll find these people there, you'll find these kind of people there, and when you get there, those are the people you are there for. They are people you need to rebuke, the people you need to challenge, the people you need to lift up, the people you need to correct, and you do everything in the strength of the Lord, the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. As we look at this mandate, there are two sides. Number one, you know them and happier. You blessed are you if you do them. On the other hand, he that knows to do good and does not do it, tell me, to him it is sin. You know that there are things to set in order. Then uh, you turn a blind eye. You act as if I can't see. There's something going on there. And then we need to set that in order. And that's the place we need to get up and go right there. Because this is the ministry God has called us to go set that thing in order. But you are a coward. But you don't have courage. But you don't have the stamina. And so you turn the other side and they're doing their thing. And somebody came to tell you and said, Pastor, Pastor, something is going on there. It's going to destroy the church. It's going to make everything collapse. You see, we're praying about it. Don't pray about it. Do something. Titus was not sent there to go and pray about things that are disorderly. He said, go right there, have the stamina, have the courage, and have the mind, and have the power of the Holy Ghost. Go set things right. You will do it in Jesus' name. You know, the days are gone when we pretend we didn't know. We pretend we didn't see anything happening. We pretend we didn't know anything was wrong. We know things are wrong. And we're going to go there in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord. And these is our calling, these are mandate, they will be done. This church will stand right. This church will stand solidly on the word of God. And it is with you and it is with me. I said it is with you and it is with me. And he says we will set things in order that are not right. The time of fear that is gone time of timidity that is gone time of you know dropping ahead and see if you know something what is going to harm us let them try let them try as god dried up the hand of jeroboam before that young man of god he'll dry up their lives not only their hands not only their hands he'll dry up their lives and everything that belongs to them because we are here to do business for God, and we're going to do it. Somebody there said we're going to do it. You will do it in Jesus' name. Tonight, I'm talking to you on the authoritative mandate for appointed ministers. The authoritative mandate for appointed ministers. And three points we're going to look at. Number one, the preaching of sound doctrine. The preaching of of sound doctrine. That's exactly what uh, Paul the Apostle told uh, Timothy. Look at chapter 2 verse 1. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The preaching of sound doctrine. Point number 2. The pattern 
of sincere dedication. The pattern of sincere dedication. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, tell me again, in how many things? In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. And in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Point number two, the pattern of sincere dedication. That you offer yourself to the Lord afresh. You consecrate your life to the Lord afresh. And you become a pattern of the kind of consecration dedication that we should have in the whole ministry. That if everybody were like you, the church will be on fire. If everybody were like you, the church will be evangelizing. If everybody were like you, in no time at all, will win the world unto Christ. And you want to make yourself a pattern, a pattern of zeal, a pattern of passion, a pattern of focus, a pattern of strategy, a pattern of sincere dedication. Point number three, the power of a soul stirring declaration. The power of his soul's telling declaration. Look at verse 8. Some speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil sin to say of you. God will perfect your life. He will purify your life. Anything that happened in the past that you know people might say, Hi about this, hi about this, the Lord will cleanse you. Amen. The Lord will cover you. Amen. The Lord will protect you. Amen. The Lord will purge you. He will even take the remembrance of that thing away from their head, away from their mind. So that when they look at you, they will not see the past, they will see Jesus in you. Amen. They will see glory upon your life. And then as you declare the word of God to you yourself, you will forget your past. Say, I will forget my past. I'll forget my shortcomings in the past. I can't hear my people. I'll forget my mistakes of the past. I'll forget who I was. Can I hear you? I will remember who I am today. And then it says the, the righteous as bold as a lion. And then you go forth, forget the past and move on in the strength of the Lord like Gideon and you will overcome. Yeah. The power of a soul stirring declaration. Point number one. If you are writing notes, tell me point number one. Wonderful. What a good church. The preaching of sound doctrine. We're coming to chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. You understand if you have learned uh, the rules of grammar, we don't normally start a sentence with but. But the reason why this but is there to start with is that when the New Testament was written, there were no punctuation marks, comma, semicolon, colon, full stop. All those things were not there. It was at a later date, actually 13th century, that somebody felt to make it easy for us to refer to the Bible and say chapter this and verses, that he read through the Bible and put the chapters and the verses. That's why you have this now, beginning chapter 2. Originally, all those things were not there. It was just reaching directly just like when you write a letter and a piece is a letter you don't uh, put uh, when you're writing a letter one two three four up to 25 and then you are reading those verses you just write the letter that's the way it was reaching so then you understand this word but connects us with chapter one why do we have that but there because of chapter 1? Come back now to chapter 1. And I'm reading here from verse 10. It says in verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers, but you'll be of sound doctrine. It says there are many deceivers there, but don't be like that. You preach sound doctrine. Especially day of the circumcision. Don't go that side. Stay with sound doctrine. Then it says, whose mouth must be stopped. And if you are the agent of God, you are the means of God to stop their mouth, you must stay with sound doctrine. It says, they 
convert whole houses. They turn the houses upside down. They turn those people upside down in confusion, teaching things which they ought not fulfill the local sick. Then he says, but you will be very different. That's why the but is there. He says, look at how they are. Look at their lifestyle. Look at their conviction. And look at the confusion they are bringing. He says, but you will not be like that in verse 12, but one of them, even a prophet of their own sage, the Christians are always liars, evil bees, and slow bellies. He says, but you must be different. That's the essence of what Paul the Apostle was telling Titus. He said, Titus, you will see the people there. Of course, that's why you are there. If they were doing right, you will not be sent there. They're doing wrong. They're going the wrong direction. They're not saying the right thing. They're not doing the right thing. But you must be different and thank God you'll be different. You know, sometimes uh, people, they come into a community and they're sucked up into the community. The peculiarity of that community, if a lying, like, like the Christians, if lying is uh, the in thing in that community, they're sucked in. They say, if you're going to, you know, live in these people, uh, live with these people, I've studied them, I've seen the way they do things, I've seen the way they go, and so I will be like them. And Paul, the apostle, was telling Titus, no, you cannot be with them, you cannot be like them if they are covetous but you will preach sound doctrine and you will stand for sound doctrine and if they are kind of uh, deceptive you will not be like that and if they are drunkards you will not be like that if they are smokers you will not be like that if they are polygamies you will not be like that he was telling him you will be different thank god i'll be different i said thank god i'll be different Look at verse 13. It says that this witness is true. Wherefore, what do you do? I say, what do you do? Uh, look, look up here, look up here. You know, somebody there is a liar. The other person is a deceiver. And then the pastor himself, he has come in. He's a new pastor. And he's learning about uh, what the people are doing. And he's uh, picked up something now within a few weeks and within a few months. He knows that, you know, if they want to say yes, they actually say no. And their no means say uh, yes. And he has learned their culture. He has learned their language. And then the members of the church are coming to him. Uh, and they ask him something thing and he knows that these people whenever they want to say yes they'll say no and then he says no they know that they have bought him over they have influenced him they have changed him he came with scripture he has dropped the scripture they gave him tradition he came with christianity they have changed him they dropped christianity they have given him culture he came with the truth, and then they have changed him and turned him around. They gave him lying. And so he too will say no, but he meant yes. And then somebody said, Pastor, you mean yes, but you are saying no. And then the pastor says, but I know that that's how you do things here. That's what you say here. That's how you live here. Uh -huh. You cannot be a change agent. You will not change anything. If you are like the people, you will not transform anything you know, if you are like the people. But if you are different, they are dirty, you are clean. They are black, you are white. They are false and you are truthful. And they are wobbling, but you are standing straight and standing firm. It is that decision and it is that character that is bold and courageous. And it is different from the people that will make you to be able to set things in order that are wanting there. You know, sometimes it happens in a place of work. You get to a place of work in our country here. And the people, here is the way they normally do the work. How slow they are. They hide the files under somewhere. And then they are waiting for bribes before the file will come out. And then they walk to rule. They are very slow. And every, you know what happens in the offices. And then you get there. You get there as a pastor. You get there, you're a minister. You get there, and the Lord is sending you there to set in order the things that are wanting there but then after a few weeks you are walking like them after a few weeks you are telling lies like them after a few weeks you are deceiving like them after a few weeks you are just doing the same thing they were doing and you call yourself a Christian and then you come on Sunday to church and then you are acting as a Christian no you are not a Christian you are not a real Titus you are a Christian now I pray God will transform even our lives and send us forth to transform this country in Jesus' name. And that's why it says, 
rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. It says, not giving heed to Jewish fables, don't even listen to them, or commandments of men that turn from the truth. Then it says unto the pure, all things are pure. It's talking about animals they eat. It says, you know, some people say, I don't eat that, I don't eat that, because in the Old Testament, that one is unclean. That it says, now the Lord has sanctified everything unto the pure. If God has purified your heart, has changed your life, it says unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, it says it's nothing pure, and even, but even, it says uh, even their mind and their conscience is undefiled. Then look at these Christians now. Look, at, they come to church. They come to church. Religious people. It says they profess that they know God, but tell me, it works, they deny him. Their character says, no, you are not Christians. Their behavior says, no, you are not a Christian. Their attitude says, no, you are not a Christian. Their disrespect for the house of God says, no, you are not a Christian. And their life that is upside down, backsliding life, sinful life, says, no, you are not a Christian. Because in works they deny him. And he says, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate. And then, verse 1 now, but, you see that, it says, look at the lives of the people, deceived, deceived people, deceptive people. Look at the lives of the defeated people. Look at them sinful people. Look at them backsliding people. Look at them professing that they know God, but they really deny him. It says, but, but now, thank God, that but has come to your life. You'll be totally different. I said you'll be totally different. In your family, your family will be different. Your community, you'll be totally different. In your place of work, you'll be different. And when you come to church, you know, if I'm different from other pastors, and you are different from other pastors, and our choir different from other choirs, and our ushers different from other ushers, and our youth different from other youth in every other place, and everybody in our church different from the way the other churches are, the whole church will be different. I said the whole church will be different. If our women are different, if everybody is different, and we have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, and we carry that holiness everywhere, and we're not ashamed because we belong to Christ, and Christ lives within us because we're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, but the life we now live, we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. If that happens to everybody, we're saved, we're sanctified, we're circumcised, we're filled with love and we're filled with the word of holiness and we're carrying that about everybody will know this church once they interact with you before you even say anything they say, you have deeper life, aren't you? what do you say? Yeah. Oh, you say eh, well, I, I go there, shame on you shame on you, I am deeper life number one no, you cannot be number one since I'm number one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I am deeper life number one. And anywhere I go, people should be able to tell that's a Titus there, that's a Timothy there, that's a Daniel there, that's a Ruth there, that's a Mary there, will be different in this country in Jesus' name. And then we preach that. We preach sound doctrine. And look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 2. It tells us here in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. It says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. It says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort without long suffering and doctrine. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears and he said they shall turn away from the truth they turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables tell me the next word there tell me again you see, that word but makes you different from what we have been reading about. Look at verse 3, it says now but. Look at verse 4, it says now but. Then it says in verse 5, it says but watch thou in all things. So I'll watch. Endure affliction. 
and he says do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry you will do it in jesus name you see, much preaching today in the various churches, much preaching is what we call motivational preaching. They just motivate them, be happy, have self-esteem, and then go out and succeed, go out and achieve, go out and win this, go out and win that. That's not gospel. Motivational preaching, psychologists can do that. In fact, psychologists are the people that do that because they are motivational speakers. They are there in the world. It's a profession. And we're taking, we're dropping our own profession in the church and we're taking their profession. There are people who are success achievement preachers. They're not talking about heaven. They're not talking about salvation. They're not talking about holiness. They're just talking about success, about achievement. The people who are called fashionable preachers. You see, they see the fashion of the day. They see what the people are looking for. We call them trendy preachers. They follow the trend. They follow the trend. They are the people that are called customized preachers. They customize their message to what the people want. The people want to jump and dance and be happy and forget about their sorrows and give them that. But we are not customized preachers. We are preachers of sound doctrine. I said we are preachers of sound doctrine. There are people, we call them user-friendly preachers. If they are talking to politicians, they are friendly with the politicians. They will never say anything that the politician will feel guilty about to repent. They are user friendly. If they are talking to youths, they talk about what the youths want to hear. If they are talking to women, they talk about what women want to hear. If they are talking about business to business people, they talk to people about business and they never mention repentance. They never mention sin. They never mention heaven. All they are thinking about about is to be user friendly. We are not like that. You say, but preach thou, speak thou the things that become and the things that befit sound doctrine. What does that do? Teaching sound doctrine, number one, will convict of sin. It's for preach sound doctrine. Those who are sinners, those who have not known the Lord, number one, they'll be convicted of sin. Number two, it will bring conversion to the soul. Conversion to the soul. They will go to Calvary and they will get on their knees, on their faces before the Lord. They will call upon the Lord and they will repent. Number three, it will crucify self and crucify the old man. You preach sound doctrine and you point people to Calvary and you talk about Jesus Christ and you lift up Jesus, it will crucify self. It will crucify the old man. Number four, it will warn of danger and damnation. It will warn of danger and damnation. You see, motivational talk cannot warn anybody of danger, anybody of damnation. That's not their style. User-friendly preachers, they cannot warn anybody of danger or the damnation to come. And the people customized preachers, those who are customized, it's like they doctor the thing, they tailor the thing to feed the needs of the people, physical needs, they're talking about family, they're talking about this, they're talking about that, but they're not talking about sin, not talking about heaven, not talking about salvation, they're customized preachers, and they will not say anything that will show the people the danger and the damnation before sinners. Number five, a real sound doctrine will expose expose corruption and evil will ex expose corruption and evil people are corrupt in their offices they are corrupt and they steal this and steal that and then they you know they come to church when you come to church if you preach some doctrine you will expose that corruption and that evil they'll be asking the question sir sister madam uh, mother what will i do to be really saved uh, number six uh, if you're preaching some doctrine you'll be contending for the entire faith contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints it will not just be that you yeah, kind of overlooking sanctification 
You are avoiding holiness or you are avoiding one man, one wife until there's a dual spot. If you preach some doctrine, it will create the thirst and the passion and the desire and the hunger for heaven. People will want to get to heaven. You describe heaven and then you describe hell. They don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven because your preaching sound doctrine creates the thirst and the hunger and the passion and the desire to want to get to heaven i pray that that will be the kind of preaching you have in jesus name we will teach the word of god we'll teach sound doctrine i come to point number two now point number two the pattern of sincere dedication the pattern of sincere dedication we're coming to titus chapter two titus chapter two i'm reading from verse seven Titus chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, I'm going to ask the question, I've asked it again, in how many things? Showing thyself, who is this one talking to? Titus has gone, Titus has gone. Who is this addressing today? Where is he? I said, where is she? Thank God you are going to be. I said, thank God you will be. Forget the past, forget the past. I was weak. Thank God you are using was. Don't say I am weak. I was. I said I was. I said I was. I was timid. Don't say I am. I was sick. Don't say I am. I was down. Don't say I am. I am now. I am strong. Let the weak say, "You are strong in Jesus' name." Be it unto you according to your confession. Be it unto you according to your faith. Here it says now, in all things, in all things, showing thyself to be a pattern. Uh, first of all, let me emphasize, according to the word of God, that thing, in all things, in all things. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, it says in verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Yeah, it says, and every man, how many people? Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, tell me, in all things. If you're really, t if you're striving for the mastery, you will look at your, you don't just come to the church, the leaders development, and then after we're finished preaching, and then somebody leads us in prayer, and then we just go back home and forget. You will go back home, you'll say, now I, I need to settle down this thing. I want to have the mastery. Mastery over my life. Mastery over my thoughts. Mastery over this ministry. Mastery over this assignment God has given me. And it says, he that striveth for the mastery. Lord, if no other thing happens, I want to have maturity and mastery. And therefore, I must be temperate in all things. I must be well controlled in all things. You look at all the things in your life. That area, I was careless. That area, people know me that this is the way I, I've been. That area, people know that this is the way I've been, but I'm not striving for the mastery. Anybody striving for the mastery there? And it says in all things, you will be temperate. I pray God will confirm that in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. All things, all things. Look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. In Second Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 9. It says, for to this end, that is for this goal, for this purpose, to this end also, did I write that I might know the proof of you, of you whether ye be obedient, tell me, in all things, how many things have we learned that uh, you need to check up again, you need to review everything you have been learning. And Paul, the apostle said, you know, I'm reaching to you so that you will be obedient in how many things? In all things, you check up on your own life. You say, I, I now want to be a serious student of the word, a serious believer in Christ. I want to be a, a serious follower of Christ, and I want to be a serious minister in the kingdom of God, obedient in all things. That's the Bible. And then I check up this, I check up this, I check up that, and I see that that obedience must come in. It will come into your life. I'm looking at chapter 6, chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 4. Chapter 6, in verse 4, 2 Corinthians, and it says, but, tell me, tell me, 
but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. In all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. You are in the bus, you are in a taxi, and then you are interacting with people. You remember, I must approve myself as the minister of God. Different, distinct. The people will know me and say, there's something different about this man. There's something different about this woman. The way you carry yourself, approving yourself as the minister of God. The things to discuss, the things to share, approving yourself as the minister of God. That you come to a place and you know the people, they are like this, they are like that. But when you get there, you are the minister of God and you approve yourself as the minister of God in all things, in all the conversations there in all the interactions there in the buying and in the selling whatever it is you are doing, wherever it is you are you know that in all things I am here and I must leave a mark behind that I'm a minister of God, it will happen I said it will happen and if in the community they are talking about this, they are talking about, about that, when you are coming and they know that that's a minister, there's a preacher of holiness coming, let's stop this scene after he's gone, maybe we can continue but you know, he's here now they have recognized you I pray that that recognition will come upon every one of our lives in Jesus name it says in that verse 4 in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're, we're looking at what it really means about in all things. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. It says, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him. Tell me, in all things, which is the head of even Christ. It says you are in Christ and you are growing up into him. You are growing up into his character. You are growing up into his conviction. You are growing up into his obedience. And in everything, what will Christ do if Christ were here? How will Christ talk if Christ were here? How will Christ behave if Christ were here? What decision will Christ make if Jesus Christ were to be here? And in your life, as you are moving on, you are growing up. If you used to be somebody who will talk without thinking before, you stop now, you sit back, I must think, I must not be like I used to be. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I always think on this low level. I always think on this human level. I always think on this, you know, I always look at economy. I always look at this. I always look at that. But Jesus will not do that. And I'm growing up into him in all things. You're becoming a serious character. You're becoming a devoted person. And you're becoming a zealous person in the Lord. Because now in all things you are growing up into him Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 18 Hebrews chapter 13 what verse are we looking for verse 18 open your Bible pray for us for we trust that we have a good conscience tell me in all things willing to live Honestly, it says a pray for us, but we trust, we trust. There is the confidence we have. We have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Anything that will make your conscience, uh, you know, to be less functional. Because you see, when you do something wrong, your conscience will say, hey, don't do that, don't do that. If you do it again, your conscience will say it, but it will lower the voice. Eventually, if you keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on doing that wrong thing, you know, your conscience will be quiet. Your conscience will be dead. It says, we're not doing anything to dead in our conscience. We want that conscience to function. We want that conscience to be alive. We want that conscience to be active. We want that conscience to be functional. And it says, having a good conscience in all things, willing to, be, to live honestly. And then in First Peter, First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 11. First Peter chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 11, talking about in all things, in all things, First Peter, what chapter? And what verse? 
reading from verse 11. Open your Bible so we can read together. As we look at uh, First Peter chapter 4 and verse uh, 11, here is what it says. If any man speak, and thank God somebody there is going to speak. And sister there, you are going to speak out. If anyone speak, let him, let him speak as the oracles of God. That's how you speak. Don't speak as, you know, that's how they speak in our language. Don't, don't do that again. That's how they speak in our tribe. Don't say that again. You are now a minister. And you are the titles in the creed of today. And because the Lord has appointed you, if any man speak now, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God gives him. A giveth that God in how many things? In all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It says as we minister and as we speak whatever we do it says in all things in all things that Christ will be glorified. Look at this. It's not that I may be happy. I may, I may have to do something that you know may make me unhappy but this will make God glorified. This will lift up the gospel. You might have to do something that you know will make you tired. He says, get there quickly. Run there quickly. And already you don't have all the strength and you run there quickly and God is glorified. It makes you tired. Makes you sacrifice. Makes you, make, makes you deny yourself. And makes you forget about friend and forget about anybody. And you say this will glorify God. And people might even be persecuting you and they're talking against you or whatever. But you say in all things. Everybody say in all things. I'm going to glorify God. You will in Jesus name. We have read this before. Let's read it again in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 5. It says, but watch thou, tell me. But watch thou, tell me out aloud. Watch thou in all things endure affliction. Endure affliction. You know, there's affliction everywhere. Affliction everywhere. Even those who are not Christians. If you're going to be a driver, for example, you're driving taxi, there's affliction. If you are going to drive a ball, sometimes there's affliction. If you are going to be a farmer, sometimes there's affliction. If you're going to be a fisherman, sometimes there's affliction. If you're going to be a teacher in a primary school, secondary school, sometimes there's affliction. There are difficulties and challenges associated with any profession. And and therefore, if you have any challenge, if you have any difficulty associated with the ministry and the mandate God has given you, thank God you will stand for it. And thank God you will live for it in Jesus' name. But if, you know, somebody is cooking in the kitchen and then she cannot bear the heat of the kitchen, nobody is going to have any food to eat. If we're going to have food to eat, we must be able to bear the heat in the kitchen. And if we're going to be able to do any profession, any profession well, the profession of teaching, the profession of an engineer, the profession of a builder, or the profession, any profession we're going to do, if we're going to do anything successfully, there must be something that will put into it that will say I'm going to sweat and I'm going to suffer for it in all things. So make yourself the minister you ought to be and you'll succeed in Jesus name. Look at that again. It says but watch, but watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. We're coming back to Titus. Titus chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 7. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. It says in all Think showing thyself uh, to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uh, uncorruptness, sincere gravity, and sincerity. The call is very clear. The command cannot be misunderstood, misinterpreted, and you cannot lower the command. It says each of us must resolve to meet God in the place he appoints. You cannot say, God. 
this standard is too high. Let me come down here because this is all I can do. No, you cannot do that. God is standing up there. God is living up there. And that's why he sets the standard. And you will have to climb the mountain, climb the ladder, and get to where God is because God will only meet you at the place he has appointed, not at the place you are appointing. Well then, he's telling us we must be a pattern, number one, in good works. In good works. You have abandoned evil works com completely. You have jettisoned, you have thrown away from your life evil works completely, and you are a pattern of good works. Anything you, have, uh, you want other people to do, which is a good work. Anything you want other people to do, which is a profitable work in the kingdom of God, that's where you set yourself a pattern. You start it and you begin it. Not really that number two, you are a pattern in character. Because it says in all things, and the character is very important, and so you are a pattern in character. Your character will show that you have seen that God has set you up as a model. And as a model, you want to have that character that glorifies the Lord. Number three, you are a pattern in commitment. A pattern in commitment. People can see you. You are a far away in the front and people are running after you. They say a pastor, our leader, a women leader, a youth leader is a man, is a woman of commitment. And because you set yourself like that as a pattern, all the others, they'll follow after you in Jesus' name. Your pattern is zeal. You're not lukewarm. You're not like a desical. You're not carefree. You're not doing it whenever you can. You're not saying today I'm going to give myself vacation. You're on the move every time, on the go every time. And if a pattern is zeal, all the other, you're not going to have to be announcing. We're having crusade and let the people come. We want to go out where to, this week is uh, for tract evangelism and let's do it. And the people are not coming because you have not been a pattern. If you're a pattern of zeal, the people are going to rise up and follow. And what you're a pattern in courage. A pattern in courage. You know, if you chicken out, if you're weak, if you're like, you know, everything is over me, if you cannot bear, a little pain has pinched you, and therefore you are crying, I have pain, I have this. You don't have courage. And then you are there, you will say, I don't know what's in the dark, I don't know what's in that state, I don't know what's in that region, I don't know whether we can go or not. Of course we can go go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And until you have finished your assignment here on earth, nothing can touch your life. And therefore you are a pattern, you are a pattern in courage. You are a pattern in consecration. A pattern in consecration. You lay everything on the altar. You see there are people they can preach consecration very well and they can say consecrate your life, can consecrate this and consecrate that. But when you come to think about it, analyze their lives and see the way they do things, they are not consecrated themselves. But if you are a pattern in consecration, it will not be difficult to lead other people to that same consecration. You are a pattern in service. A pattern in service. That's what Paul the Apostle was telling titles he said be a pattern be a pattern don't stay at the back and don't mix with the crowd isolate yourself distinguish yourself come to the forefront of the whole pack and be a pattern in service you'll be serving the lord i said you'll be serving the lord a pattern is self-denial. You see, the people who cannot deny themselves, they cannot deny themselves of, uh, you know, whatever, a little thing there. And we have to deny ourselves so we can be there. We have to deny ourselves so that we can be in the place we ought to be at the time we ought to be there. And we need to do something. There are many things to leave behind. There are many things to just, you know, throw away and say, that cannot be, that cannot be, because I have an assignment, because I'm going to do something that no other person can do you. No other person will take your place. You know, but the people are always thinking, well, if I'm not there, there's another person that can do it. You look at all these multitudes of people. Do you think that my absence will make any difference? Thank God, my own absence will make a difference. I says my own absence will make a difference. You know, but if you are thinking, well, there's somebody to replace me, I pray that nobody will replace you in heaven. 
Uh, but you know, the people that do your work, they'll get your reward. The people that replace you, the people that, you know, take your place, they also take your place over there. And they take your glory over there. And they take your reward over there. Nobody will take my place. I'm praying for you. Nobody will take your place. Even if there's another person that can do what you can do, let God find his work for him. God has given your work to you. Titus is there, Titus is there. I'm sure Timothy could have been in, a, in Crete so that Timothy will set things in order. But Timothy, you have your assignment in Ephesus. Say there, this one, I will do this one. I said I will do this one. Am I talking to somebody far away there? You will do your work in Jesus' name. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will empower you. The Lord will energize you. You will be a pattern in service. You'll be a pattern in self-denial. You'll be a pattern in obedience. You obey the Lord. You obey the Lord. When the Lord says, this is what to do, oh Lord, I'm the person, first person to do that because I am going to be a pattern. A pattern in obedience. No, uh, um, you are going to be a pattern in holiness. Holiness without which no man will see the Lord. You will be a pattern of holiness in Jesus' name. You will be a pattern in competence. You are, not, you are not a person that is always an excuse maker. Well, I know that's not perfect. That's all I can do. Thank God I can do more. I said I can do more. I know that that presentation is not good enough, but you know, accept me the way I am. No, don't accept me the way I am, because I want Christ to lay big inside me. I want the Holy Ghost to take over my life. I want every imperfection in my life to be perfected by the Lord. And if that is your desire, you will do it in Jesus' name. And you'll be a pattern in communication. How, how, can, you, how can you preach the word without having good communication? How can you tell them what to do? How can you bring sinners on their knees? And how can you bring saints on their face? If you do not have good communication, you must be a pattern in communication. You must be a pattern in love. You love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. You love your neighbor as yourself. If you are a sinner and somebody knew the way of salvation, you want them to love you enough to tell you the way of salvation. Well, there are many sinners around you. Love them like you love yourself. Somebody to you go and tell them you'll be a pattern in faith a pattern in faith god will increase your faith god will make your faith functional god will improve on your faith in jesus name you'll be a pattern in sacrifice sacrifice david said i will not offer any sin to the lord that costs me nothing whatever i'm going to offer to the lord it will cost me time it will cost me money. It will cost me sweat. It will cost me energy. It will cost me strength. It will cost me whatever it is. But I'm not going to offer anything to the Lord that costs me nothing. I'll be a pattern in sacrifice. And then you'll be a pattern in yieldedness. You know, there are people... They never bend. They never bend. There are people, they never yield. Uh, look up here. Somebody is walking like this. And as he's walking, he sees uh, somebody coming in front of him. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, having a log of wood that is long. And it is the height of his forehead. And he's going and say, I never bend for anyone. I never yield for anyone. Well, when nothing crushes your head and knocks you down, you will be forced to yield. You're not going to be like that. The Lord has been talking to you over and over. My child, this is the way to go. My son, this is the way to go. My daughter, this is the way to go. Yieldedness, you will yield. You yield your heart, you yield your spirit, you yield your life. Everything you got, you yield everything to the Lord. Because you are a pattern, a pattern in yieldedness. You are a pattern in humility. You see, humility is very important. It looks at the proud far away and they then he wants us to be humble in the sight of the Lord. You are a pattern in giving. A pattern in giving. A pattern, so much a pattern in giving when it comes to time to give. To give your money. To give an offering in the house of God. You will not be coming to church every time and forgetting that, you know, I didn't take offering today. Why is it you are forgetting every time? Be a pattern in giving. And then let your wife also be a pattern in giving. Let your children, let them learn at 
this early age, their pattern in giving, a pattern in seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord. This is your soul, this is your heart. It is like fire burning inside you. Any sinner on the street that does not know the Lord, there's something that is drawing you to them because you have a pattern in seeking the Lord, you have a pattern in building God's kingdom on earth. God's kingdom on earth. In all things that God has called us for, for us to be a pattern, and I pray that days will be replicated in your life. It will be reproduced in your life. And that you, 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 you'll be singled out. You'll know that that is the man. That is the woman. It's a woman of God. It's a man of God. And this, we know him for something. We know her for something. She's a pattern of good works and she's a pattern in all things. He, we know him too. He's a pattern of good works and he's a pattern in all things. May the Lord confirm it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And let's come back to that Titus chapter 2 again. Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In all things, how many things now are you going to be a pattern? In all things, showing thyself a, a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness and gravity and sincerity. Look at verse 8. Sound speech, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having nothing evil, having no evil to say of you. Can you look up for a moment? That Satan, the day has come. I said the day has come. Amen. Satan will look at you. He'll shake his head. He doesn't have anything to say evil about you. The demons will hover around while you are praying and you are making a demand. You are saying, give me this mountain. And the demons are around to find out whether they can find something to accuse you of. All those demons, they will not be able to accuse you of anything. And there, while you are praying and you are bold in prayer, like Joshua, you say, I'm on the battle of your son, stay there, moon, stay there. And then there's somebody that is wanting to accuse you of something, maybe they can accuse If I regard the iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And they look at everything, they cannot find anything to accuse you of. That everyone that tries to accuse you of anything, they will be ashamed. Amen. Satan will be ashamed. Amen. Demons will be ashamed. Men accuse us, women accuse us, they'll be ashamed in Jesus' name. They can even go and talk to God about you and say, God, look at him, look at her. And then God will say, that's a perfect son of God, perfect daughter of God. Don't touch that person, don't touch that man, don't touch that woman. I'm going to listen to his prayer. I'm going to hear a prayer. It will come upon your life. That you will know that they have nothing, nothing evil to say of you in Jesus' name. And then, you know, they, they, if you're like that, you speak with persuasion. You speak with passion. You speak with power. That the word that is coming out of you will actually be like burning flame in the hearts of the people in Jesus' name. And see how Jesus manifested that in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 32. Luke chapter 24. And we're looking at verse 32. It says in verse 32, And they said one to another, Did not our heart born within us when he touched with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures why don't you claim that that you want to be like jesus christ that you're going to give sound speech and you're going to give sterling speech and you're going to give soul searching speech that when people listen to you then they will say our hearts burned it was like flame it was like fire it pierced us it inflamed us it drove us to our knees and we wanted to do something you know, for the lord i pray the lord will affirm that your life in jesus name that when you speak people will listen when you speak sinners will repent when you speak believers will be transformed when you speak it says will be filled with the holy ghost in jesus name look at acts of the apostles acts of the apostles and i'm reading here from chapter 7 from chapter 14 acts of the apostles chapter 14 and we're looking at verse 1 the power that comes upon you that your speech becomes pinching and pungent and poignant it tells us in acts chapter 14 verse 1 and it came to pass it will come to pass in your life 
in your district it will come to pass in your group it will come to pass in your in your zone it will come to pass in your region in your state nation it will come to pass in jesus name and it came to pass in iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the jews look at this look at this and so speak everybody tell me and so speak and so speak say it aloud and so speak that a great multitude both of the jews and also of the greeks believe that's it that's it sound speech that even those of the contrary part will not be able to say anything to the contrary they so speak they so speak that multitudes believe that time has come in your life we're looking at chapter 18, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, and we're reading from verse 24. It says in verse 24, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man. Any eloquent man there today? I said, an eloquent woman there today. God will give you that eloquence. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus, mighty in the scriptures. And when you read your scriptures, when you learn your scriptures, when you know your scriptures, when you preach the scriptures, and you are mighty in the scriptures. Look at verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews. He mightily convicted the Jews. He mightily drew the Jews. He mightily drove the Jews on their knees. He mightily convinced the Jews. And that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Jesus is Christ. I said Jesus is Christ. Uh, you see, some speech does not mean that you take the cold meal out of the fridge of reservoir that you have had in your nose and then you deliver it to sleepy, slumbering people. And by the time you finish, those who are cold became colder. Those who are lukewarm, they remain lukewarm. No, you're matching the scriptures and the fire of the Spirit of God mixes with that word. And then those people, they will wake up in Jesus' name. Uh, the Lord has spoken to us today what we ought to be, like a pattern. What we ought to be, like real preachers of the real New Testament. We need the gift and the grace of God, and God will give it to us. We need the freedom and the fullness of the Holy Ghost, and God will give it to us. We need the purity and the power of the Holy Ghost, and God will do it in us. Today, the Lord can transform your life can transform your ministry and it can raise you up like a titus and send you once again to where you are coming from and it says go back there now be a renewed minister be a transformed minister and be a minister that you will stand on your two feet and you'll stand erect and firm with real backbone sinners are going to come to the kingdom through you saints are going to be transformed through you demons will flee when you mention the name of jesus New power, new authority, new anointing will come over your life. The time has come. Rise up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm here. Oh Lord, I'm here. I want that power. I want that anointing. And I want that rejuvenation. I want that renewal, transformation. Let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. Pray like you never prayed before. And seek the face of the Lord like you never sought him before. And say, Lord, I'll be the Titus in my creed today. I'll be that Timothy in my Ephesus today. I'll be that man. I'll be be that woman, let your fire come, let the power come, let the freedom come, let your fullness come.